Good to go, sir. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's Dan Belleville um, calling from the County of San Mateo Emergency Operations Center. Uh, this is the third sort of part of our series of some outreach uh, after the CZU fire. The first two of which we called the town hall meeting and then the second or follow-up town hall meeting. Uh, today's presentation uh, is to provide additional or changing information that has occurred over the last couple of weeks that we think will be helpful to the community. <clears throat> and we have a number of different speakers. So we're gonna use much the same format as we have in the past. Uh, but before I get started and talk about that format, I would like to introduce um, Supervisor Don Horsley, who has been instrumental in fire protection measures and all things fire in the county for quite some time, several years running, and has been um, very helpful to this process and some of the pieces that uh, we're dealing with as we go through the recovery effort. So uh, Supervisor Horsley, do you have a few words for us, please? Uh, thanks, Dan. I, I guess uh, well, two things I wanna do is I wanna thank all the staff people uh, for following up and being available. I also wanna make sure that people who are on the call who know that you know, the heritage of San Mateo County and the south part of the county is really important here. The agriculture, the open space, um, the, you know, the beautiful uh, south coast is, you know, something that we all treasure and um, want to make sure that we're going to protect it and preserve it. So um, this is a, we're just trying to hear on this, this meeting is to make sure that all of your questions are answered, that your, your life is basically put back together. Um, and we also at the same time want to wish all of you a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, um, Happy Holidays, however you want to take it. We just uh, really want the best for our community and we're here to serve. So with that, uh, I will turn it back to Dan. Thank you, Supervisor. Again, thank you uh, to you and um, our County Manager, Mike Callagy and the rest of the Board of Supervisors for giving us all the things that we need to provide clarity and support for the folks that are listening in today. And as you mentioned, this is a, it's a pretty complicated uh, effort to restore uh, a community after a fire like this. And it was the worst one that we've ever experienced in this county. And perhaps it won't be the last one. So we're doing our best to reach out. And um, as the supervisor said, if we fail to uh, provide some of the information that'll be helpful to you, we're always available here at the county to address one-on-one -on -one questions should they come up. So I'll talk a little bit about the ground rules, much like we did before, but uh, before I get to that, I wanted to welcome uh, the San Mateo County team and some of the partner agencies that have been with us during the entire process. Um, it is truly a community effort, starting with the supervisors and through the departments and the department heads and, and their assistants. Um, both FEMA and uh, uh, Cal OES have all been very instrumental in getting us what we need so we can serve you. Uh, today we have uh, Heather Forshee from our Environmental Health Department. She's been with us um, along the way with our uh, town hall meetings. Jim Porter, the Director of Department of Public Works. Uh, we have Paul Lim and Mike McKeon from uh, County OS that works along with myself. Nicholas Calderon with our Parks and Recreation Department. Steve Monowitz with our Planning and Building Department. And then also from FEMA, we have, um, like last time, Virginia Hale and uh, uh, Barbara Kane. And then uh, we also have some CAL FIRE OES uh, folks that have been um, immensely instrumental in helping us along the way. And I'm not sure which of those are on board, but they are here to answer questions uh, should they come up. So before we get into the, uh, the content of our presentation, Miles, could you spend a few moments talking about the details of how this process works and, and some of which we talked about last time that we did our outreach? Sure thing, Dan. Um... So a few ground rules, as you uh, know, you are all muted uh, upon entry. Uh, we ask that you kindly remain muted uh, through the duration of the presentation. Um, if you do have questions, as Dan mentioned, we'll be uh, answering those in the Q&A period uh, in the, after the main presentation. Uh, we would prefer that you use the chat box function. Um, it's available in Zoom for those of you who are using the web app or the app to dial in. Um, if you are if you're not able to use that chat box function, there's also a raise hand function where you where we can call on you and you can audibly give that answer. Um, or if you are dialing in from a phone, you can press star nine and we will see that your uh, virtual hand is raised and we can call on you uh, during that Q and A period. Um, we also have translation services provided today by Victor Hernandez. Thank you, Victor, for being here. And if you are using those translation services, um, please. 
uh, press either, please either raise your hand in the, in the feature on the app or press star nine if you are dialing in. And Victor, if you'd like to translate um, what I had just said for the speaking. Gladly, Miles. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, les quiero dejar saber a todos aquellos que necesitan traducción en español. Si me hacen ustedes el favor, pueden este, marcar el número de teléfono que acabo de poner en la cajita de chat. Es el 1-877-568-4106. Y si pueden este, meter el código de acceso, que sería el 877-394-8696. Para recibir toda la traducción en español simultáneamente. Gracias. Thank you very much, Smiles. Thanks, Victor. And I'm understanding that there are a few folks who are having a little trouble dialing in. So, what I'm going to do is, if you happen to be in contact with those folks, what I'm going to do is post um, again this access code as well as the password to the chat feature um, in the chat box. But for those dialing in who may want to write it down, um, the features for this call, our meeting ID was 810-55350934. Again, that meeting ID is 810-55350934. The passcode to enter is 817690. Again, the passcode 817690. I'll be posting this to the chat feature. So uh, in case you happen to be in contact with folks who are having a little trouble getting in, they can use that code um, to dial or um, use the app. Um, Dan, that's all I have right now and looking forward to chatting with you again here in the Q&A. Thank you, Miles. Just so you know, in the last couple of seconds there, you faded out so you could check your sound system, but uh, thank you to you and Victor. Victor, thank you for the translation services you've been with us, so you round out the team. And then lastly on the introductions, folks, is um, we have Chief uh, Jonathan Cox with CAL FIRE, who's been with us along the way, um, primarily um, fire suppression, but then um, all things recovery as well, and um, some guidance from other state fires. So thank you, Chief, for being a part of that. If you just joined us, um, we're going to do a presentation here similar to the other ones. And the purpose of this afternoon was to try to provide as much new information as we can before we go into the holidays, because we have Christmas and, and New Year break. And we felt it would be important for you to hear some of these things rather than wait another week and a half or two weeks. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and start. And my first introduction will be a familiar person, um, actually two people, but starting with Heather Forshee from Environmental Health. Uh, following Heather, we'll have Jim Porter from the Department of Public Works. So Heather, we've talked about a number of things. It would be helpful if you could take it away, please. All right. Well, the time is here and phase two is about to begin. I know everyone on this call it has been waiting for this day for um, months now, and we're just super excited that uh, it is upon us. So for those of you ha who have been out in the field, you have seen some of the crews moving around, uh, performing initial site assessments uh, and asbestos assessments. Uh, they've been taking pre-cleanup photos. They've been flagging asbestos for cleaning up uh, by separate crews. Um, and as you know, the asbestos from the chimneys, roofing materials, siding materials, uh, those are all being flagged for uh, a separate pickup. But um, the great news is, is that the cleanup teams with their heavy equipment are mobilizing in San Mateo as we speak this week. And they will be starting in the field, they will be starting on the first property um, with luck on Monday morning. Now, um, folks want to know if they're going to be notified. The crews have uh, assured every, everyone, including us here at EOC, that they will be reaching out to property owners. They will be making phone calls before they move on to an individual property to, to you know, actually start debris removal. And so um, they'll be, if they can't reach you, they will leave a voicemail. Uh, and it, you know, they'll make several attempts to reach you to let you know that they're on their way. So please keep an eye out for that phone number that you don't recognize and uh, pick up the phone this weekend, uh, right after you celebrate Christmas. So let's talk about um, active cleanup operations. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what's going to happen, there are going to be crews that are going to move on site. They're going to bring heavy equipment. They're going to, uh, 
have cruise teams out there, uh, some of whom are going to be wearing uh, head to toe um, protective gear. And it is incredibly important that you are not on site in the way while the crews are on site. It's a, you know, they're going to be busy moving, you know, large equipment around and uh, it's a safety hazard for you to be there walking around with them. So please be respectful, stand off the property. If you've got questions, um, you know, you can refer them, you know, ask me or if there's somebody who can, you know, step aside and talk to you. Um, just, just be mindful that um, it, it is a safety hazard for you to be moving around on the property. Um, and it's also a health hazard. There's going to be ash being moved around. And of course, there is that pandemic that's going on. And we want to make sure that we minimize any contact um, between, between residents and the cleanup crews and, uh, to uh, mitigate it, the spread of COVID-19. They have protocols in place. And so please don't feel hurt if uh, they don't want to approach you. Uh, they've got to keep moving. So burned vehicles, for those of you who have burned cars on your property, those are included in the state's cleanup program. And so uh, at no additional cost, I know that there were some questions around that there, you know, there is no cost to, you know, having these, these burned vehicles removed if you are part of this, uh, the state's cleanup program. They will be marked, they'll be spray painted. Um, uh, the vehicle identification number will be noted on the DMV form so that it can be inactivated in the DMV uh, database and uh, they will be hauled off in the early stages of the cleanup. So just keep that in mind um, that, you're, that these uh, burned cars will be removed. So time frame, everybody wants to know how long is this going to take? Uh, it's taken us this long to get here. Um, they're saying that the actual debris removal typically takes only two to three days and that's if they don't hit any problems uh, but there's a lot more to it than just taking a front loader and you know removing burned uh, ash and structural debris uh, there's also the hazard tree removal um, and uh, other miscellaneous items uh, will be removed uh, and before anything can be wrapped up, soil samples need to be taken and they need to be analyzed to confirm that they've removed all of the heavy metals from the soils uh, beneath your burned structures. And I know uh, a number of you had batteries that were burned. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we want to make sure that everything uh, left over from these burned batteries were um, uh, hauled off site. In addition to the soil sampling, they're going to be hydromulching for erosion control before they leave your property. Uh, and then once all of that is finished, they get the results back and the cleanup is, it has been satisfied uh, adequately, then Cal Recycle will sign off. So how long does this entire, entire process take for a parcel? If things go well, maybe three to four weeks uh, because there are several steps and you know there's the lab work that takes a little bit of time to turn around. So let's talk about what you might see on your property. I think we've got a photo um, that we want to share with you. Cue the photo. All right so towards the end of the cleanup you are going to see um, flags similar to this and what these flags are are uh, their locations that soil samples will be taken or, uh, so there's going to be some marking on the flags and the flags are roughly the perimeter of uh, the debris footprint of a particular structure so please don't touch them don't move them uh, or remove them um, they are there for a reason and uh, know that when you do see those flags that we're you're towards the back end of your cleanup and so that's a good sign. So let's talk about hazard trees. We've gotten a lot of questions around hazard trees and um, it, it, it is confusing. So properties with hazard trees but with no structural damage um, but where the trees may affect a public infrastructure or right of way uh, may actually be eligible if those trees are on residential properties. 
And so we've been encouraging these, you know, folks who have trees that may qualify to submit uh, an ROE to have those trees removed. Now, um, the trees will be evaluated and marked by professional arborists as they move through there. And um, the arborist will determine uh, whether the trees are healthy enough to remain or need to be removed. If you do have any questions around what is eligible and what is not eligible for hazard trees, uh, there's some great information on the FAQs and the um, eligibility checklist on the county's fire recovery website. So you would just, again, go to the smcgov.org website and look over on the right side for the wildfire recovery tab. It's, it's all there. If you haven't been to the website, really, we encourage you to go there. That's where all of the FAQs are. So let's talk about hazard trees on private property that threaten a home or other structure, but don't threaten a public right of way. These do not qualify. So I know some of you have submitted ROEs just in case for your hazard trees. We're reviewing those, but um, we'll let you know um, if they are not eligible um, for removal. Now, hazard trees on undeveloped parcels, um, private property, uh, where uh, they threaten private roads, community roads, such as, uh, I don't know, Redwood Ave or Madrone or Cougar Ridge, um, those are still being determined whether they're eligible. FEMA has not made a determination. So for those of you who have properties, residential or undeveloped properties um, with hazard trees that threaten these community uh, non-public roads, uh, we're still waiting to hear back on those. So hang tight, we'll let you know. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Heather. Um, Heather mentioned that there are arborists that are part of the assessment team that'll be working on determining the health of the trees that they're looking at, as well as their impact to the right of way. Um, on some of those trees, you'll see markings. Um, they have different letters and numbers and colors. Uh, without getting into any detail, the, the real takeaway is please uh, don't touch the markings are on those trees. Those mean something to the arborists and the contractors that are coming through. So similar to the flags, we just ask that you um, please don't disturb the markings on the trees so that when the crews come through, they'll be able to assess based upon the arborist determination whether those trees will be removed or whether they will stay. Thank you, Heather. All right, now let's go over these right of entry forms. Everyone on this call should know what an ROE is by now. Uh, so most of you who are eligible for uh, participation in the state's program have already submitted an ROE. And um, you know we're really appreciative of that. There are a few of you who have not, mostly hazard trees, you know, we're not, you know, maybe on the fence and as to whether you're eligible. Um, the ROE form deadline for submittal was extended by the state to January 15th. And so if you have not submitted an ROE yet, but believe you may be eligible, please hurry up and submit this. If you've got any questions, we're all here to help you. And um, at the end of the day, if you submit an ROE, but ultimately are not eligible, we'll let you know. Um, and uh, there are several uh, properties that have not been, uh, who have submitted ROEs, but have not been um, uh, accepted into the program yet. It, they are still pending review and you know who you are. Uh, we've, we've submitted the requests on your behalf. So let's talk about um, uh, Spanish language ROE. We do have a Spanish language ROE posted on our website for those of you who, um, who would find it uh, helpful to use that. So please access this, the county's uh, fire recovery page to, to get the Spanish language version. Let's see, so um, let's cover the, the insurance. For those of you who did, did not read the ROE thoroughly, um, please review it again because it describes uh, the, how the insurance will work for uh, cleanup. Uh, and, and supporting documentation is also on the county's fire recovery website. And uh, it, if you are 
eligible for and are participating in the state's cleanup, there is no out-of-pocket expense. That's the great part about this. And so if you have any questions, please review the FAQs, review the fine print on the ROE, and between the two, you should have all of your questions answered. If you don't, please reach out to us um, at the EOC. Let's talk about debris removal in general. So uh, as we discussed the last time we were on, on this call, debris removal is required for all of the properties, regardless of whether you are eligible for and participating in the cleanup program, state's cleanup program or not. And so if you are not eligible, you still have to go through a formal cleanup program. It's just with environmental health. So you can't clean the property up yourself. Uh, there is a process and it parallels, it, it mimics the state's process. Uh, you have to have approved asbestos contractors identified. You have to submit a work plan to environmental health. You've got to go through the process, identify landfills, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, prior to signing off, you have to have soil sampling performed and uh, reviewed by a county environmental health. So you, you, you can't clean the properties up by yourself. Um, it, it does require uh, support and assistance and guidance from either the state or county environmental health. If you've got any questions around that, please contact us. Um, San Mateo County's uh, environmental health um, website and all of the information, there's a link on the, on the county's fire recovery page. So if there are any commercial property owners here, um, I'm sorry to say that commercial properties in general, there, there are some, some minor exceptions, um, are not eligible for state cleanup. And so if you are not eligible, again, I hate to sound like a broken record, you need to contact environmental health before you start moving, moving debris around. Also, if there are any residential properties that are rejected by the state's cleanup program for any reason, then they get kicked to county environmental health and you start the same process, securing an appropriate contractor and subcontractors and going through the program um, with environmental health. So either way, it's gonna be the same cleanup either out of your pocket or uh, uh, courtesy of the state. And uh, just to clarify, burned vehicles on commercial properties are also required to be removed and uh, environmental health will inventory and, and um, help guide you to remove those, those burned vehicles. So let's talk about relocating back to your property. There've been a lot of questions around this. We have just started our phase two removal and everybody's looking forward to having uh, the, the structural debris and the hazard trees removed. And you know, as soon as that's done, people wanna start rebuilding. Now, before you can relocate back to your property, the urgency ordinance is pretty clear uh, in that you do have to go through county environmental health and planning and building prior to relocating on your property, even temporarily. Now, I'll speak to environmental health concerns, uh, and I've spoken with a number of you um, privately. There has to be a functioning way for you to dispose of waste, uh, uh, and also you've got to have a potable water supply, for example. And so these are, these are things that we would want to make sure you have in place before even temporarily moving back into the properties. So it does require um, working with environmental health before you plan to do that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve with planning and building to talk a little bit more uh, about the, his requirements. Thanks Heather, Heather and good evening everyone. Um, well, I think that there's probably two steps to um, getting back for many of you. Some might be a temporary relocation um, while you do your uh, planning and execution of your rebuild. And um, the planning and building department has accommodations for that, but it's important that you diligently pursue the long-term rebuild as, you know, temporary structures are not an effective means of long-term housing. So um, we're here to help you with regard to the long-term planning and permitting required to rebuild your property 
and um, we're happy to work with you to accommodate whatever temporary housing that might be needed while you pursue those permits. Um, as Heather stated, um, having safe and clean infrastructure is a key component to that temporary housing as well as the future rebuild. So um, I encourage you to work with her department to make sure that your water supplies and septic systems will be functioning effectively and will be able to accommodate your future needs. And if you have any questions about uh, either the temporary um, reestablishment of your residence or the long-term rebuild, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and my staff. Thanks very much. Turning back to you, Heather. Actually, I think I might next be next up. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit. I should, I should ask Heather, are you, are you finished with your remarks? Hey, okay, Heather, Heather you're, on, you're on mute. Confirm your, you, anything else? You're good? Okay. And Jim, are you going to go into winter debris? Yes, I am. Okay. Just for pause for one second. So, um, Heather, thank you for that. I can tell the folks that Heather and her team are passionate about helping you out. Um, and so reach out to her. There's a lot of information that was here. As Miles had said early on, this is a recorded uh, presentation. So you can go back to a lot of the information that Heather talked about. And if you can't get it in the recording, sure, she and her team will be happy to address those concerns that come up. So um, that's the beauty of having this recording. A couple real quick things too, Jim, is um, on Cal OES, we have uh, Byron Green, who is our state and local representative. Um, and so he's on board if we have any questions. And then a reminder, like we did last time, if you have questions, we, ha we have a little bit more of the presentation, but you know, jot it down and we'll have this question and answer period if you wanna get clarity from Heather or any of us. And um, I had one other note. Um, I guess there was a problem with our call in, but I think it was just a mixed number. Uh, Miles, is that correct? If someone wants to call in as we get towards the end? Correct. Um, they, they can still dial in on that one tap mobile number that was posted here. Okay. And uh, folks are still able to join throughout the okay. meeting. Okay. Just want to make that clear so people can think about that. All right, Jim, sorry for the pause. Uh, Jim Porter, our uh, department's, uh, Department of Public Works Director. Jim, on, on uh, winter debris flow. Thank you, Dan. Um, I just want to speak briefly about winter debris flow potential. Uh, as you know, we've had a very dry winter so far, which is good. Um, but we do expect rains this season. I just wanted to remind everybody about the, um, what's called the WORD document, the Watershed Emergency Response Team document that was prepared by CAL FIRE right after the fires occurred. That document is extremely comprehensive and provides probability um, estimates of when debris flows may occur within the burn area. Um, just as a brief overview, you know that the fire burn the most intensely in the southern portion of the county. So you can see on your screen now, um, there's a, a, a drawing showing the burn area. Without being able to, it's very difficult to see, but the areas that we're monitoring closely is the Gazos Creek area, which uh, really has a moderate uh, opportunity for debris flows. Then as you move further north, the chance of debris flows reduces. So the Butno Canyon area is north of the Gazos Creek drainage. There's a low chance of debris flows in that area, although there still is a chance. And then as you move further north, um, the hillsides along the Lomamar area and near the Pescadero Creek area also have a low chance of debris flow, but there is a chance of debris flow. So the WORT report goes into quite a bit of detail as to what amount of rainfall will trigger a debris flow. Just as a rule of thumb, that number's right about two tenths of an inch every 15 minutes. So you figure roughly eight tenths of an inch in an hour. But uh, you, know, you need to remember that that's just an estimate, that um, debris flows could occur with less rain or more rain. It's not really um, as predictable as we like, but we will be monitoring those areas. Uh, and I think Dan will go into a little bit more detail about um, weather radio offers and some of the work that the, o the EOC will do in notifying people. So Dan, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, compliment to Jim and his team. His folks have gone up there after the most recent rains that we've had, although they've been mild. We are monitoring things and pay attention to uh, the weather systems that come in. So it's been a multifaceted approach. We have a pretty comprehensive plan for debris flow. If you've not followed us in the last couple of meetings, um, they can be tremendously hazardous and have killed a number of people after some of these major fires have occurred in California. So we're certainly trying to prevent further injury or, or potentially death. So we take it very seriously. Um, Jim's team will also post some signage. Uh, his teams are ready to not only clear out things that might get clogged up from some of the debris flow, but also to per provide some signage in the area to remind people of the hazards associated with incoming or inclement weather and, and the rainfalls that he talked about. Uh, as part of our plan uh, for the debris flow, we have the, the operations um, center here has, has ordered a number of weather radios because we know that many of you live in a remote area and they're pretty reliable radios with the frequency. So uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you in the Office of Emergency Services to talk about how we're gonna issue some of those radios. And if you're so inclined, uh, Mike can answer some questions. Mike, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so we've been working with different community organizations that are active in the Pescadero area. Namely, we're working with CERT, which is the Community Emergency Response Team. And we're working with Puente to make sure that we're accessing other communities in the area. And what they're going to be doing for us is helping us identify those individuals that are at most need for these radios um, by circulating our uh, emergency communication survey. Um, you might be familiar back when you sub we sent out the original right of entry. There was another document that came along with that, which was asking what best ways you have to communicate available to you at your home. Um, to date, we've received a number of those back and we're cross-referencing those addresses against the image that Jim uh, pulled up earlier, the, the um, word reports, risk assessment, we want to focus really heavily on those areas that have that red tier, the significant increase in risk of debris flow. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're spreading these weather radios out so that we can make sure that in the event of communication failures, there is uh, a safety net for, for our residents. Um, we've received the, the weather radios at the beginning of this week, and I'll be hooking up with Chief Delay actually tomorrow to begin uh, disseminating some of those radios. Thank you, Mike. Um, I've grabbed a radio here, so uh, if I can step back here. They're pretty small, uh, but they're very effective. They're Midland radios. Um, they're 110 volt radios, and they have battery backup, so they're pretty reliable. And so these are the kinds of radios. They're not some big clunky thing. It's a, it's a pretty handy little radio. Okay, so that concludes our section on the winter debris. And just wanted to remind folks that, um, you know, going back to Heather's comments that her, the efforts to clean up are also highly dependent on clear weather. So things will certainly change if we get a lot of rain and how that debris uh, cleanup, you know, moves forward. There may be some delays associated with that. So hopefully we can get most of this done before we run into kind of a muddy mess in some of those areas. So with that said, that concludes our presentation. And now we will open ourselves and make ourselves available to questions and answers you may have. So Miles, I'm gonna to go to you to see if we have any queued up. Dan, we actually do not. Um, to, as a reminder, folks, uh, you are more than welcome. And in fact, we prefer you to use the um, chat box feature to type in your questions so that they may be recorded for everyone to see. If, if you're unable to do that, or you would like to use a Spanish translation, uh, and you're using the Zoom app, please use the raise hand feature um, available to you uh, on, on the Zoom app. Uh, additionally, uh, you can press star nine to raise that hand over, um, over the phone. Okay, Miles, so we'll just pause for a moment until we, uh, looks like we're hearing from Nancy here. Yes. Nancy? Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, no, Miles, I'll let you run it. Go ahead. Uh, Nancy, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I just did. I just realized the only way I know how to do the raised hand is to literally raise my hand. Uh, anyway, I just have a question about the hazard trees. Uh, when you were explaining it, uh, it sounds like a hazard tree is a tree that would fall down on like a county road. Uh, my property is off of Wur Road. 
in Loma Mar. Uh, and so I do have a tree that ended up with a pink flag around it. It's a redwood tree, a very large redwood tree. Would your people, A, would your people have put the pink flag around it or how did that pink flag get there? Um, and secondly, it could, if it fell towards where road, it would probably reach the road. Um, do, does the lay, if I know I have a tree of question, do I have an opportunity if I do the ROE, which I haven't, to show them the tree I'm concerned about, or do I just let them roam around and see what they find? So Heather, we have you and Jim, we've been talking about tree issues. I know that Kendra uh, Boyer from the state just joined us. So I don't know if you wanna tackle it first or um, Heather, I see you just popped up. If Kendra's on the line, Kendra, I would be echoing or trying to uh, speak for Kendra. Okay, Kendra's been instrumental. Kendra, are you there? Hi Dan, I'm here. Hi, Kendra. I don't know if I know you just jumped on. I know you're very busy working with all the counties and thank you so much for what you've been doing. Did you happen to hear Nancy's question about the trees and we'll go directly to you if, if you're uh, in a position to answer? Yes, absolutely. I sure did hear her question. Um, so to answer this, I kind of heard two questions there. The first question I heard was about a pink ribbon and a pink marking. Um, our markings are not pink. So if you have a, that pink marking must have been done by somebody else. Um, but not okay. by the hazard to the state hazard tree removal program. Okay. Um, our mark. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, our, our markings um, for both the the right of way, the public right of way, and then private property is blue spray paint or orange spray paint. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm un forgive me. I'm unfamiliar with that road. Is that a, a county maintained road? Yes. I believe so. It's okay. It, I think so. I guess the county would know that. We know. We need to know the exact location for that to understand what whether sure. it's county. It's, or not. Sure. Where okay. The, well, where, if, it, if, it, if it is on the the um, county maintained portion of the road, uh, if the tree is marked with if it's on the county road, it would be marked with orange paint. Um, if it was a tree that was assessed by our contractor or on private property, it would be marked with blue paint. Um, for your specific situation, you, you would fill out the right of entry form and you would be welcome to um, point out specific trees that, that you think may be a hazard, but um, the arborists are required to look at all, all the corners of the property that would affect the public right of way based on the parcel boundaries that they know your property um, is. So they would be required to assess all trees that uh, appear to have uh, been affected by the fire and then make the determination on whether they believe that they would survive or if um, they would die with either now or within the next five years. Okay, good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. Thank you, Kendra. Nancy, any other questions? You're good with that, correct? I'm good with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. If you could mute yourself again. And uh, Miles, I'm going to go back to you to see if we have anything up, uh, queued up. Yeah, we have a question uh, from Casey from PMAC. Uh, is the county still planning on staging heavy equipment in the South County if heavier weather is predicted? Uh, this is Jim Porter. Yes, we are. Uh, we'll have equipment uh, stationed off of Cloverdale Road prior to a storm that um, potentially could qualify as a storm that has enough intensity for debris flow. So yes, that's still in our plan. Jim's, Jim's team is flexible. It mobilizes and then pulls back and mobilizes depending on the situation. Correct, Jim? Right. That is correct. Thank you. Miles, next question. There are not any other questions that I can see at this time. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Dan. Okay, so I'll... Um, I guess I, I, I guess if you want to turn your video screen on and you had a question and you've not been able to sort of figure this out, we can look for you. But I, other than that, I think we will conclude the meeting. We're right on time. We wanted to finish um, at about uh, 445 and we're five minutes shy of that. Hey, Dan. Uh, yes, sir. If I could add, I forgot to mention, I keep referring to this Watershed Emergency Response Team report. That report is available on the county website for anybody to review. If you go to the county's homepage, 
there will be uh, a link to the, it's called the Joint Information Center. When you get to that page, there will be another link to the Watershed Emergency Response Team report. So um, I would encourage you to read that report. It's very, uh, a lot of information in there. And that's what we're using as the basis for um, determining which storm events really we're gonna be looking at in terms of positioning our equipment in order to respond to any potential debris flows. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm gonna turn it over, um, before I turn it over to Supervisor Horsley, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, to, to, to stay safe, the Emergency Operations Center has been open for 10 months now. We've seen quite an escalation in COVID. So please um, take care of yourselves uh, through the holidays. Uh, I'm very happy to report, if you hadn't heard or read it, that we, uh, we started distributing vaccinations the last few days. Today, we got the first batch of firefighters um, who are the first on the scene to treat patients. So that is underway. And, and we would expect here in the Emergency Operations Center um, to see things improve every single month. So hopefully, we're going to have a real good 2021. And each consecutive month, will get better and better. So um, I hope you all take care of yourself. Supervisor Horsley, any co final comments? On, on mute, Supervisor. It's kind of hard, a little trouble finding the little button there. Uh, but just uh, some of the uh, firefighters, the uh, Kings Mountain firefighters, the volunteers were, some of them received their vaccination, I think within the last 24 hours. So it's, um, they are hitting even volunteer firefighters. So I just want to let the community know about that. And I actually have a question. And it's not a question that anybody has to answer, but there's a information that Casey Dunn sent me about a potential demolition of an old uh, bridge and then the building of a berm. So I just want to make sure, because he sent me information and then he, I then sent it to uh, Steve Monowitz. So I just want to make sure that uh, Casey and Steve have connected on that issue because I, you know, I, he, I know that uh, people in, in uh, Butin are really concerned about potential uh, Steve? Close. Yeah, 10-4, uh, supervisor. Ten, um, ten, all right, I like that, 10-4, good. Back <laughs> the old days, 10-4, over and out. <laughs> so you no, not I, I over and out. I mean, there's a lot of conversation to be had, okay. but uh, we've um, connected. Thank you for forwarding that information. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to work with um, the folks as needed to protect that water supply, without a doubt. And my last comment is I really want to thank the staff people. Uh, you guys have really been on it uh, and handling business in a way that's professional and rapid. And I, I think our constituents approve or uh, appreciate it as well. And I wish all of you a happy holidays as well as uh, all of my great uh, constituents out there on the South Coast. Thank you, Supervisor. So it uh, looks like there's one more question, Miles. I just texted him. Miles, who do, who do we have yeah. on board? Yep, we have Casey again from PMAC who is asking uh, the WERT, uh, I don't want to pronounce that acronym, uh, missed some VARS in Butano Canyon. Uh, is there any use to updating that document? Paul, do you want to talk about that, the VARS? In the EOC? Sure, and uh, um, I would invite um, Jim to hop in any time to uh, help me out here on the VARS. Um, so the work team and their analysis of the post-fire debris flow hazard, and that's what the VARS are, are basically assessments of the chance of a debris flow in certain areas. So um, they are very technical, they're engineers, and they did their assessment um, very shortly after the fire. I don't even know if it was 100% contained. They were already out there um, making their assessments, and um, they canvassed the entire burn area. And so they have, uh, in that work report, and it, I believe it does break it down, they have a very specific criteria in what counts as a VAR and what VAR rating it is. Um, I do not believe that they will be doing any reassessments at this time. There isn't any plan 
Um, so they probably will not be updating that wort. Uh, unless there's another, uh, you know, heaven forbid, another fire or a hazard out there. Thank you, Paul. Jim, anything to add to that? Um, not really. I think Paul covered it pretty well. Uh, that report is not prepared by the county. That's prepared by Cal Fire. So um, I know that as the um, assessments continued, there were identifications of areas that um, I don't know if they were in the VAR report or not, but we've been hearing from folks on, on different values at risk. So I don't think the report's going to be updated, but I think that information has been collected. Okay. So there are no more questions. So I'd like to close by thanking the supervisor, the county, my team members. That it takes this entire county, multiple departments working some crazy hours to do this presentation, um, to provide what, what, what we're doing. Couldn't do it without FEMA and Cal OES. They've just been fantastic. Um, so all along the way, and if there's any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, as we mentioned in the earlier part of the presentation, uh, this is recorded. So uh, Miles, thank you for engineering. Victor, thank you for translating. I'm gonna wish everyone a happy holiday season. Uh, season's greetings, uh, Merry Christmas from Santa. And uh, just hope you all relax and stay healthy and enjoy your families, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much.